40s and I know that muscle and cognitive uh, function will decline in the next two decades or so so how can I address that proactively is really what I'm focused on. Hello again and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Well, today we're going to delve into one very specific aspect of the science of aging and try to answer the question, could pomegranates or strawberries help us feel younger as we grow older? We're going to focus on a substance the body produces when we eat certain foods and ask why a Swiss startup company is so excited by its potential, potential to improve our mitochondrial health. From Switzerland, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Arunag Singh, Chief Medical Officer at Amazentis. Dr. Singh, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you for having us and uh, giving us an opportunity to talk about our work here. It's great to talk to you. Whereabouts in Switzerland are you? Uh, so we are based uh, out of the Lake Geneva area, close to uh, Geneva in a small city called Lausanne. Uh, it's actually a hub for a lot of uh, famous universities in the area. So we, we are just uh, based out of the innovation park of the Swiss Institute of Technology here in uh, EPFL in Lausanne. Excellent. And tell me a little bit more about your company. So the company uh, is Amazentis. It's actually a, a startup uh, spun out of uh, the Swiss Institute of Technology. Uh, um, it's built uh, based on the work done by a lot of famous professors here in the in the universities who have focused a lot of their careers on uh, understanding mitochondrial biology and, and how that contributes to age-related diseases. So Amazentis was started about uh, over 10 years back uh, with, with the concept of basically bringing the biotech approach to the nutrition uh, field. Um, a lot of biotechs are mostly focused in the pharmaceutical space, but there was a need to really bring the deep dive you know, science approach and the biotech way into nutrition. And so that's what we have been doing for the last 10 years. We have been basically looking at different nutritional compounds and trying to really understand uh, on human biology the effects and how they translate from worms to human cells to mouse cells to uh, rodent animals and then really starting to uh, do some very nice human clinical trials and we are gearing up to actually launch our products next year. Well, we're going to delve into the science in much more detail. I'd like, first of all, just to find out a bit more about your career, sure. what brought you to this kind of work and sparked your interest in this area of science. Mm -hmm. Sure. So by training, I'm an internal medicine uh, doctor and I specialized in allergy and immunology. And this was uh, starting in India, in my medical training, and then moving on to the U.S. And then I was hired by a company, uh, Nestle, out of Switzerland, that was kind of getting into this uh, space between uh, food and pharma, and they had started a subsidiary called Nestle Health Science. And so I ran, basically, global trials uh, all over the world for them, and mostly in my speciality in immunology and then in aging. And the immune system with aging declines, so... A lot of uh, old people who get vaccinated, uh, they don't give very good uh, antibody uh, responses, immune responses. So that's how my interest in the nutrition space and the aging space uh, started. And then from there, I moved to Amazentis five years back. Yeah. Did you have to agonize over the decision to move from being a practicing doctor, being an MD, to moving into the research field <laughs> and pharmaceuticals? Sure. Yeah, the, you know, it's uh, most doctors... Uh, uh, the traditional career path is to really go and practice. Uh, I was lucky to have a mentor in the U.S. who was also a trained doctor, and uh, he said, well, there's no part-time research. You're in research full-time if you're really committed to it. And so, yeah, I, I made that decision, and I think it was really a good decision. Okay, well, let's dive now into the science and the work that you're doing at the moment. And you mentioned mitochondrial health. Let's go back to the basics mm -hmm. and explain the function of mitochondria and why they're so important. Sure. So m mitochondria, you know, they're like uh, the cellular powerhouses. Uh, the standard textbook definition is, well, the powerhouse of the cell. But they're really these tiny pockets of energy that keep all our cells and tissues and organs going. And as we age, basically, uh, what happens is the, the mitochondria do not function optimally. So 
with aging, what happens is you start accumulating a lot of faulty mitochondria and, and there's, that basically take up space. And there's, so there's very little space for new mitochondria to, to, to be uh, synthesized. That's called as something called as mitochondrial biogenesis. And that leads to basically lowered ATP and energy levels. So that's the mitochondrial theory of aging, basically. And that's what leads to muscle dysfunction or decline in muscle function that also leads to uh, neuronal decline or brain function decline. So you get diseases like uh, Parkinson's disease and other diseases that are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. But it is generally, this is a natural cause of aging. It's something you would expect to see in everyone. Yeah, yeah, but... You know, I, I think uh, what uh, what Amazentis is trying to do is is basically disrupt. Uh, we, we see ourselves as sort of the genetic of the nutrition space, where you know we we take a deep dive into a, a health area and we try to you know deconstruct it and find how some natural compounds can benefit it. Now, this is the physiological pathway. Doesn't mean you can't intervene and and delay uh, health span, so you can prolong health span. We, we don't want to delay lifespan uh, necessarily, but we do believe that acting proactively in your sort of healthy aging uh, part 40 after, you can really impact on, on, on uh, keeping your mitochondria optimally functioning longer. I'm glad to hear you using the phrase or words health span, which I talk a lot about on this podcast, sure. maximizing yeah. the amount of time that we enjoy optimum health and of course in terms of muscle strength mm-hmm. as people get older frailty is a key problem and it is sometimes the beginning of the end when people are unable to stand up people start yeah. falling over that kind of thing it sounds very basic but it is very important to healthy aging sure no absolutely frailty is really the the end absolute end of the aging spectrum so you know the typical frail sort of vision frail person vision that you see is someone walking with a stick or in a wheelchair struggling to cross the, the street. But what, what we want to do is really reach out to the issue even earlier, what I call as pre-frailty, okay? Uh, we've all, we've, uh, last year we published, our group published a very nice study in Dutch old people, uh, and Dutch are known for their physical activity, so we compared Dutch old people who basically are very active and you know running uh, 10Ks almost every month and we compared them to couch potatoes sort of elderly pre-frail people who have low muscle strength and what was really striking when we did muscle biopsies for example we took little chunks of muscle tissue and we looked inside after doing a battery of physical function tests really this outstanding feature was mitochondrial health so people who did exercise for 70 years all their life you know they were really had optimal mitochondrial health but people who were not very ac- in, they were inactive and they were sedentary. They had poor mitochondrial health. So I think that's really the the key frailty. You can by intervening either with exercise or with nutritional interventions or with other. Now there are a lot of companies in the space of pharmaceuticals trying to intervene early to, to really delay this sort of what I call the frailty march. You know, it starts early on. Yeah, it is quite striking, and I think there've been similar. Studies looking at, let's say, a 70-year-old triathlete, someone who is still at peak fitness Mm -hmm. and showing that their mitochondrial Mm -hmm. health is akin to someone 20 or 30 or even more years younger. It's quite striking when you see that kind of data. So I mentioned pomegranates and strawberries in the introduction. What is the relevance to these kinds of foods, these fruits? So the, the, the natural compound that our company is, 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 is leading, uh, has led the discovery and now the, the sort of uh, building towards commercialization, it's a natural gut metabolite that is called as uh, urolitin A. Uh, it's produced by the gut microbiome. Uh, and it's only produced when you eat uh, pomegranates and uh, strawberries or walnuts, all the good things that, you know, uh, that are that are tied to good health. Now these uh, c- fruits and nuts they com- they contain what the precursors called as uh, elegitanins. Okay, so these are polyphenolic compounds that are very abundant in uh, pomegranates, uh, and they are also found in, in abundance in strawberries and raspberries and and walnuts and pecans. And so when you, t- for example, you drink a glass of pomegranate juice or you eat a bowl of uh, strawberries or nuts, you are getting these precursors in, the key thing is you need to have the right gut microbiome that will then harness these compounds and, you know, enable 
the release of urolitin A. So it will basically, from these precursors, generate this compound urolitin A. So that's the link to pomegranates and, and strawberries. So presumably we all have different gut biomes. Are we therefore, to differing degrees, able to do this conversion, essentially reap the beneficial rewards of eating fruits and nuts of the kind that you describe? Yeah, so I use a term uh, always that uh, optimal diet is not equal to optimal health. And I think the key factor that decides whether optimal diet is equal to optimal health is really our gut microbiome, how it harnesses all the key nutrients from our diet. And, and we've looked into it, and I think a couple of academic groups have looked into it as well. There's a tremendous heterogeneity in the gut microbiome of, of the human population. And what we see is about one-third of the human population uh, if they're exposed to the right uh, diet, if they're eating, of course, uh, a bowl of nuts every day, they will produce uh, uh, varying amounts of urolitin A. Uh, we don't find it in about two-thirds of the population. So there is tremendous uh, variability to do this conversion uh, that's r- related to the gut microbiome profile of a certain person. And, and that's, yeah, that's pretty interesting from a sort of scientific question what is the right gut microbiome? I mean, this is a question we are tackling right now as well. So just explain to me in a little more detail, urolithin A, exactly what does it do? It is a mitophagy mm-hmm. activator, mm-hmm. as I understand it. Mm-hmm. Could you explain the process of mitophagy and why that's important to us? Sure. So mitophagy is really the uh, biological process of uh, cleaning up, uh, or let's say the garbage disposal of, of the faulty mitochondria in our, our, in our cells and tissues. So think of your, you know, the, the waste garbage disposal system in your, in your house or in your, you know, uh, if, if it keeps accumulating over time and there's less and less space to put more garbage in, and after a while it will start smelling. So similar, our human bodies are, you know, um, have, have this process inbuilt into them called mitophagy that basically with aging is not very optimal. So what, you, what happens is these faulty mitochondria are basically accumulating in, 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 in the cells. And what that leads to is poor ATP production, uh, a competition of space for newer mitochondria to grow. So there are a lot of... The, today you can improve mitochondrial function in a few ways. So you can either have compounds, natural compounds, or other kind of compounds that um, induce what is called as biogenesis. So you can allow your mitochondria to grow, or you can make them work optimally. Now, urolitin A is very unique that it's the, one of the first known mitophagy activators, which means it's by cleaning the f- poor, faulty mitochondria out, it's giving space for near mitochondria to grow. So that's, in essence, is mitophagy. We've talked quite a lot on this podcast about autophagy, which is another similar sure. process that presumably works alongside mm-hmm. mitophagy, mm-hmm. Uh, essentially getting rid of cells in the body that have passed their best and need to be replaced? Yeah, yeah. So mitophagy is really autophagy of the mitochondria, very specific to the mitochondria. Uh, Autophagy uh, has been known to be triggered by a number of things, caloric restriction, uh, even exercise, aerobic exercise. And and, and, and I think, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, our compound has a very specific effect on, on mitochondria. And that's by removing these uh, faulty mitochondria with uh, autophagy or specific to mitochondria, autophagy called mitophagy. That's how it does the job. So having established that urolithin A is positive in terms of the multiple processes that need to happen within our bodies to reach optimum health, especially as we're growing older, what do the animal studies that you've been conducting, what do they show us? Sure. So this is a very nice paper we published uh, about three years back in 2016 in a very uh, high-impact journal called Nature Medicine. And this is work done by Amazentis in collaboration with some of the uh, key labs in, in the Swiss Institute of Technology, including the lab of Professor Johann Ovrix. And, and what they showed really was in different, let's say, aging models or you know, old animals given uh, 22 months old animals, this is equivalent to a 75, 80-year-old human being, that were fed just for six weeks uh, uh, urolitin A orally in their diet, they started showing about 40% uh, higher er- endurance. So they were running faster and longer. And, and when you looked at the muscles of these, uh, of these old mice, they, they had better mitochondrial function. And now what was also done was um, 
sort of middle age uh, spectrum was also uh, investigated. And mice that were given a high fat diet, for example, that is known, you know, synonymous with a 50 year old overweight uh, human being person, when urolitin A was given from, let's say, 16 months to 24 months, which is about an eight month intervention, uh, these mice were running faster too, and they had better muscle strength. So this was really the, the, the key discovery. And what is key to remember about these, uh, this work and this paper uh, is that uh, Johan and his team, Professor Albrechts and his team, and, and the team of Amazentis at that time, they went from worms. Traditionally, worms are a very uh, used mo- model in, in, in aging research. So they went from worms to cells to animals, and now even humans. So the mechanism seems to be very sp- focused on mitochondrial uh, rejuvenation which is another word I use for mitophagy. So going from worms to rodents to human beings, can we realistically expect to see the same kind of impact, the same Mm -hmm. kind of Mm -hmm. effect in a Mm -hmm. person? No, we are very optimistic about this because uh, we have uh, just uh, published our first uh, uh, clinical studies on on, on urolitin A. And and what we showed in these studies, so these were studies done in uh, elderly folks, who are not very active, uh, so we gave them um, uh, different increasing doses of urolitin A, and it was e- extremely safe. Uh, we did a whole battery of uh, safety tests, for, you know, looking at ECG and blood pressure and all the vital signs, and and also looking at uh, different blood biochemistry uh, profiles. And really, it was uh, it's a natural compound, so it was it had a very safe profile. And then we looked at uh, different. Uh, uh, durations of treatment. So we did one day and then we, we did a four-week uh, long uh, oral uh, mm-hmm. supplementation with urolitin A. And, and what we found was that, um, as I told you, about one-third of the population came in with lower or almost no, uh, they had some urolitin A levels and the rest of them had no uh, urolitin A levels. And when we gave them all urolitin A, uh, this was a double-blinded placebo trial. So the placebo subjects, of, of course, uh, didn't show any increase in urolitin A. But in, in the healthy elderly that received the urolitin A supplementation, we saw very nice uh, maintenance uh, levels of urolitin A. And, and then we did muscle biopsies. So this is a way you can really go deep into looking at how the mitochondrial health is in the skeletal muscle. So we did biopsies before people elderly people started uh, the oral supplementation with urolitin A, and then we did muscle biopsies uh, after the supplementation ended. And then we compared at the gene profile uh, of, of the biopsies before and after. And what was really striking, and that's why uh, we, uh, the paper that we published got into one of the leading metabolism journals, Nature Metabolism, what was really striking was that the mitochondrial gene signature was really upregulated in a significant way. And when we compared it to the the Dutch study I was telling you uh, about, we compared it to the profile in the muscle of either an active individual or a pre-frail individual who's the same age, uh, we saw that exercise was improving. Uh, The mitochondrial health in a sim, you know, our compound was improving. mitochondrial signature in a similar way. Just to explain one little bit of scientific terminology that you used just now. A double-blind study is when the person carrying out the study and the person being studied... The investigator, so the lead investigator doesn't... No one knows whether you're using a blank or urolithin A. You got it. Yeah, so the, the, the... the way you do it is you, you basically design, uh, so you, we gave in this study, we gave them in soft gel, so capsules, and and the placebo looks identical. It's just that it doesn't have urolitin A. So the subjects, when they're taking it, they don't know what uh, intervention they're taking, and, and the investigator who's giving it to them doesn't know um, uh, what, they, what they have. And is it possible to say, you're dealing with a, a 70-year-old, at what age could you perhaps correlate the level of urolithin A that they have now with this supplementation compared with what they might have had when they were much younger. Does it perhaps take them back to a, a typical 30-year-old or 40-year-old? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, so what, what we do know is that the gut microbiome changes with, a, with age, okay? So we do know that uh, w- and, and, and we compared the, the, the genomic signature in the muscle in this study that we published with, with, the, with the non-interventional group. So we compared it to people who had done exercise all their life. So the 70-year-olds who had done exercise all their life 
we compared it to that. So, yeah, people who exercise uh, all their life at 70, as you mentioned yourself, they, their their uh, mitochondrial health is pretty much uh, like a, a younger person. So, yeah, urolithin A does impart uh, health benefits on mitochondria that are similar to to you know that probably s- stop the aging of the mitochondria. And, and I'm not saying it's going to reverse it <laughs> and make you look like a 30-year-old, but yes, it, it does have an impact and improves uh, the, uh, the mitochondrial health. And clinical changes aside, data aside, more from a, an anecdotal, how do you feel mm-hmm. kind of perspective, what did this group of older people say about their sure. strength, about their vitality, about their endurance? You know, we have taken a very step-by-step approach. So, as I mentioned, we first wanted to be sure this was completely safe, which it is. Then we wanted to make sure that it was bioavailable and could boost the levels of whatever from the dietary exposure of urolithin. Then we wanted to give it for four weeks to look at what are the doses of urolithin A that will have an impact on humans. And now what we are doing actually is we are running uh, uh, much longer studies in in the U.S. and Canada where we are giving... urolithin A for four months uh, and we are making people go on a ergometer and, and they, they do what is called as an exercise uh, test where we are looking at their you know, capacity to uh, uh, produce energy and how optimal it is and then we are making them do different kind of physical functional tests like a, a, a walk test for example and, and, and so what we're really trying to assess is the effects uh, on physical function. So these studies are ongoing and they're due to finish uh, uh, at the end of next year. But I've already had a few subjects asking, well, uh, I'm feeling from an anecdotal, you asked uh, some of the old folks there, you know, saying, oh, four months, we finished your product, how can we buy it? So that's the thing, you know, they, they feel, uh, even though these are double-blind placebo trials, we don't know yet because we haven't finished these uh, longer-term studies yet. So, yeah, we are waiting on these results and we'll be happy to share them. Just moving away from your research, I'm curious to know in more general terms, your thoughts about the science of human longevity and why there has been such a boom in recent years with startup companies pursuing this kind of research? So I think um, one of the reasons why um, there's been such a growing interest uh, as of uh, late in in the science and research on human longevity is because, uh, for for one, uh, humans have been, uh, um, the lifespan, if you compare that to 1,500 years back, the human lifespan has almost doubled from 40 years to about 80 years on average now. And, And so what that means is that um, the underlying question has been on on the health span and the functionality as as we are living longer and and so a lot of startup companies are looking actively at the different hallmarks of of aging and the biological pathways whether that is linked to mitochondrial health or telomere biology or uh, senescent cells with active research going around senolytics so I think that that's really uh, the core behind. Um, um, the increase in human lifespan and, and the desire to be functionally better uh, with this increase in human lifespan. And a question I often ask, do you live your life in a way that's focused on longevity, your daily regime, your exercise, your diet? I don't really do anything on the extreme. Uh, regarding dietary choices, I do eat a lot of fruits and nuts, um, as we've already discussed, uh, that there are certain... Uh, um, phytonutrients in these uh, in, the, in the dietary choices you make that you know given the right microbiome that you have uh, can can release uh, the beneficial nutrients. So I do eat a diet rich in fiber and and I do take probiotics um, and and yeah a lot of fruits and nuts. Uh, I don't really buy into the craze on on all the ketogenic and and, and the caloric restriction diets. Uh, uh, yet, uh, because uh, I, I would wait to see more scientific and clinical evidence on those. Uh, regarding exercise, um, yes, uh, I am. Uh, I, I do run 20 to 30 minutes uh, every day. Mostly, I'm, I'm a weekend warrior. Sometimes I skip, and and hence when you know, and that's one of the reasons. What when you think about a, a person in their 40s or 50s with their busy lifestyles. Uh, you're always struggling for time to, to basically do physical activities. Uh, you want to do it, but you're struggling for time. And so there are times in, the, in, in a week where you are doing exercise, you're running outside or inside on a treadmill. 
but uh, you want to keep that physical health. You want to maintain it, and that's where dietary supplementation with uh, with uh, natural compounds, such as what we are working on, urolithin A, come into play because our hope is that they they can bridge this uh, sort of maintenance gap uh, that you can get from regular exercise. We've mentioned health span versus lifespan. Do you focus yourself on reaching a great age? Is it important to you? I don't necessarily focus on reaching a great age, but yes, uh, one of my focuses in is is on uh, being functionally better as I age. So to address actively, proactively the decline that is, you know, I'm in my early 40s and and, and, I, and I know that muscle and cognitive uh, function will decline in the next two decades or so. So how can I address that proactively is, is, uh, is really what I'm focused on and, and be functional when I'm 75, 80 years old and, you know, be able to enjoy the outdoors. So... Yeah, that I think the functionality and, and, and the health span is more important than just lifespan. Uh, you know, living to hundred and 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 not being able to be functional and you know move around and do your daily job is is not what I think from my personal perspective that I'm interested in. But but yes, being an eighty, I can imagine myself being an eighty year old and and being able to go around to the supermarket and do my groceries. I think that kind of functionality. Retention is, is uh, what uh, I would like to have. Well, finally, and thank you very much for discussing your research. Is there a way that our listeners can get more information or dig a little deeper? Well, thank you, Peter, uh, for having uh, me on, on, your, on your show. I, I think uh, listeners uh, can know more about uh, the science behind urolithin A and, and what we are doing uh, uh, actively on mitochondrial health in general at Amazentis, um, they can go into a website uh, called abouturolithinA.com or they can visit the, the company website uh, amazentis.com to learn more. Uh, I, I, I think just I would leave uh, the, the last take to the listeners is that uh, we are a very you know scientifically driven company and, and we take great pride in looking and researching new natural compounds. Urolithin A is really a, a unique compound because evolutionary it has always been uh, originating from our diets. Uh, I mean, our ancestors uh, ate a very healthy plant-based diet and, and so evolutionary as we have you know gone down that path, we have some of us have lost the right microbiome to, to harness the true potential of, of uh, and, and of course we are not all eating an optimal diet. So dietary supplementation with urolithin A can really short circuit uh, the imbalance derived from the gut microbiome and diet and, and, and allow everyone to, you know, functional function at their maximum potential with uh, better energy and better mitochondrial and cellular health. Dr. Anurag Singh, Thank you very much. Thank you again, Peter. It's a pleasure. I'm certainly going to follow your research with interest. I'll also include in the show notes for this episode some links where if anyone wants to take a closer look at the subject, they can go to get some more information. You can check out our website at lamapodcast.com. That's double L-A-M-A podcast.com. Live long and master aging. You can also rate and review us at the podcasting platform of your choice. It's always really good to hear your thoughts on the interviews that we do. As ever, many thanks for listening.